Good morning from me as well. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for kindly inviting me to this uh, brainstorm of a conference. And I sincerely hope that I'm, what I'm going to show you today does not disappoint you. <laughs> so in my presentation, I'm going to talk about the video game genre that does not often come up during uh, conferences like these. And by that, I mean conferences that tend to emphasize the relationship between history and video games. And simply because this particular video game genre does not depict history in any way and does not represent history in any way. Um, what I'm talking about is the genre of first-person survival video games and how these games could give us some kind of insight about the study of environmental, environmental history and more precisely, um, generally environmental humanism, more precisely environmental history, which is also my field. Now, this may sound a bit confusing, I do realize that, but we will take it one step at a time. First of all, the label first person survival video games that I, use, that I use is not a fixed one. And the reason is that not all developers, not all players, not all companies agree on the same terminology or the same tags as to how could we describe those games. And in order to save you from much confusion and much time, more importantly, uh, I will give you definite examples, starting, of course, with yes, Minecraft which is perhaps the most iconic first-person survival video game out there. As you know, it came out in 2011, at least the official, uh, the, ofi the first official um, version, and it, feature and it featured the fundamental idea around which uh, all other similar video games were built, that you spawn weak and powerless into a world and you have to overcome several difficulties in order to, first of all, thrive and then, first of all, survive, and then thrive. From there on, the titles I could mention are literally dozens. The, one of them is Rust, which is very popular these days because of its multiplayer feature most of the time. The other one is Ark Survival Evolved, which also contains dinosaurs, which apparently you can tame and ride. Uh, another one is Forest, which also has this great, nice horror element, which I abhor, so I, I have never played the game, but... Uh, the other one is Stranded Deep, which is a clever one because you have to go hopping from island to island in order to survive. Subnautica is another one which takes place almost completely underwater, so it's an aquatic system, as you'll find out. And uh, the genre, as I said, is in full steam, and because every year we have multiple new, multiple popular new titles coming out, uh, as for example, one of the most recent additions, which is popular, but uh, it doesn't have nothing to it, to be honest, which is Green Hell. Now, the question is, what do all the above games share and why I place them under the same umbrella uh, definition of first-person survival games? Three things. The first is that they are first-person games, which means that the player uh, sees and experiences the world directly through the eyes of the protagonist, which in turn makes the game um, more immersive it also makes it more relatable and more believable, at least most of the time. The second characteristic is that they are survival games, of course, meaning that your main objective, if not your only objective, is to survive only by interacting with the environment in which you respond. You will also find other objectives in the grand scheme of things, but undoubtedly the main gameplay element that drives the game on is that you have to cope with inhospitable environments. The last characteristic is that the crushing majority of those video games take place in what we have defined as natural environments, whether it is jungles or forests or an archipelago or the ocean even. You will find that generally man-made structures like cityscapes or even villages are not really present. Um, and also, at the same time, you will see that the main villains of those games, in these games, are natural processes or natural elements. That, that they might range from hunger to thirst, and to wild animals, to bad weather, or even in some great uh, cases, dehumanized people like zombies or tribal people. Now, despite their completely distinct storylines and narratives, all these games have one very interesting thing in common. 
which will bring me to uh, the main argument of this presentation. In these games, the player has the ability to alter the environment around him. He cuts down trees to build shelters or houses, he gathers materials to craft tools, and he reinvents at some point even some kind of sustainable economy, even whether it is agriculture or something completely different, that would eventually make the game easier and would allow the player to proceed even further. And you will see that as the time passes, as the, as the game proceeds, all that will become more massive and more intricate, to the point that the final in-game environment does not at all represent or resembles the initial environment of the game, of the early game. In fact, I said that this is an ability that the gamer has, but this is not entirely true. It's not exactly the ability, for example, to terraform, which is an ability in many, in many games. It is just that transforming uh, the in-game environment is the inevitable byproduct of the game itself, meaning that the game is, is scripted in such a way that you cannot really, you cannot, you cannot avoid altering the environment around you. And, and the reason why I emphasize upon these transformative capabilities of the player is in order to highlight how first-person survival video games force you to experience the, the in-game world as an ecosystem and not simply as a landscape, which is the case with other, most of the time, normal, let's say, normal, let's say, video games. The difference between those two, the difference between uh, landscape, the term landscape and the term ecosystem is substantial. It is not only substantial in, uh, in terms of how we approach those terms uh, in video games, it is also how we approach those terms as scholars, because both those different uh, terms have a certain gravity behind them. You see the term... Ooh, you see the term landscape most of the time describes a still or stationary image. In fact, it was kind of the reason that term landscape was reinvented in the first place by painters who wanted to describe, to describe their paintings. So they said we are landscape paintings, so landscape. Uh, it's fair to say then that the landscape is more a matter of aesthetics rather than it is a matter of essence. Uh, and you can certainly see that in the majority of video games out there where your surroundings are only a space, a 3D space which you behold most of the time, rather than interact with. Uh, now, the term ecosystem, on the other hand, is, describes something completely different. By definition, an ecosystem consists of uh, active agents that are in, constant, in a constant interplay with each other. Uh, after all, the ecosystem is above all a system. Uh, and, and the part of which are, are dynamic and in, in, in the first person survival video games that I'm talking about, the player, you, are nothing more than one of these dynamic, uh, constantly moving parts. This is also particularly crucial because it urges the player, eventually, to participate in the economics of the space in which he moves as he manages and manipulates and administers the ecosystem and its resources. And so to put this dichotomy, this crucial dichotomy in more stark words, while normal video games treat you as, let's say, a tourist in a shallow landscape, first-person survival video games allow you to perceive, to handle, and at times to suffer even uh, from an artificial natural ecosystem. Now, so far so good, I hope at least. But how is this relevant to history? Uh, it is, I would say, this is, what, this is what I argue here, it is the certain school of history that I represent, which is environmental history. And what exactly is environmental history? It is basically a perspective in historical studies where in order to ask questions and find answers, you start off by examining environmental changes rather than doing research on individuals or political parties or organizations, let's say. The reason is quite simple to grasp. The environment tends to be honest most of the time. Um, and thus, this means that it constitutes a very, a very good, reliable, first primary source 
for any historians. However, when you go there, when you, when you decide to use the environment as a starting point for your, uh, for your inquiries, it would be useful to know what kind of questions you're going to ask. Because you see, based on my own research and my own doleful experience, in environmental history at least, a set of wrong questions might direct you into constructing a very superficial story, in fact so superficial that no one cares about. Um, and a, a very a, a superficial story which doesn't revolve around that what matters eventually in humanities, which is people, eventually. The best example I can give you here is unfortunately me, because right now I'm doing my PhD research, I am in my fourth year, so I'm finishing, hopefully. And the subject that I am working on is about the establishment and diffusion of nationalism, all of the great, of the, of the Greek national idea in Northern Greece during the 20th century and so on and so forth. You already know, if the historians in here, you already know that when you do something like that, the main, the, the main corpus of literature you will find is how educational institutions or other institutions uh, the, the effect that those institutions had in the spreading of nationalism in a given area. So back then, back in 2015, I said to myself, I will not do that. Eventually, what I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to examine the ways that the state attempted to imprint the nationalist idea, this nationalist idea, onto the environment in order to convince the local population of its validity. I started examining how the state created national landscapes by erecting monuments to national heroes or even excavating important uh, ancient Greek sites. The problem, however, was that, uh, which I found out, thanks God, very quickly, that the locals, the peasants, and the people around the given areas I'm talking about, they didn't really care about all that because to them, the surrounding environment was not really a landscape, it was an ecosystem in which, which they used actually for their own sustenance. Which means that when the state came starting to building things and barring people out of their land, they had a problem with that, despite the fact, even if they, if they, even if they felt Greeks, which is not the case, they had a problem with that. As, for example, happened with a group of shepherds who became overly dissatisfied with the excavation of the ancient Greek capital city of Macedonia, as you know, it's Pella, the archaeologist here, uh, because they found out that one day, all of a sudden, an archaeologist, the chief archaeologist, had locked them out of their pastures. And they eventually resorted to, can to not cannibalism, to vandalism. <laughs> that would be even better, but no. <laughs> now, if the, if the hypothetical back me in 2015 had already internalized this crucial distinction uh, between those two key terms I just described, I would have saved a whole year of counterproductive uh, research. And the reason why something so obvious eluded me at the time was because I couldn't really put myself into the shoes of the local population who were about to receive the great um, idea of nationalism. Because, and this is exactly what, what first-person survival games could offer. It sounds for a clueless, yet willing, person like me to experience the grassroots, let's say, usability of the environment through a game. Because remember, you do not, in those games, you do not play as an omnipotent god. You play as a very weak player, as a very weak human. Finally, in order to conclude this presentation, I believe that first-person games generally do have a place in how we teach environmental human humanities in general and not only environmental history. Basically because they urge gamers to go beyond uh, the classic perception of nature, one that we still have since the Romantics. Namely that nature is sacred, nature is up there and we are the unnatural children trying to bring hair down and so on and so forth. Instead, what these games propose is simply to bear in mind that the environment is a system that contains large numbers of variable, uh, variables, one of which is basically us. Thank you. Thanks, George. Any questions? I do have a question. Um, when it comes to these games, which I understand that they are um, blank slates, as it were, from a natural perspective, if you first mm -hmm. start there, how 
integral it, is it, according to you, that many of these games are also taking place in in cultural spaces that are, are in some metaphysical meta, uh, metaphorical form at the end of history. So they're post-apocalyptic, or they're on an, almost yeah. always post-apocalyptic. Yeah. I don't know. It's a it's a weird thing because it's could you uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> because it's. There's a sense of something bad is coming. This is the reason why those games are so popular. We are very much afraid that something like that will occur one day and we will have to make axes out of stones, which is a bit weird. So this... <laughs> <laughs> so why is it weird? Yeah, what? Why is it weird that we're, with, that we're afraid of that particular There thing? is a sense of impending doom around us in those games. And again, this is... I don't really play this game that much these days because they tend to become tedious, but back then when I used to play them a bit, I always felt like, okay, this is gonna happen, so this is, this is some practical information for when Athens or any other city goes, in, goes south, and so we have to fend for ourselves mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So yeah, I don't know how else I, I could answer this question. It is... No, no, not really. I don't have anything else. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, though, <laughs> for yeah, taking this uh, this question to its natural end. Yeah. Any other questions uh, still? Ah, there we go. Ah, this one. Yes. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, don't you said that how these games sort of put humans in a sort of a natural habitat? Yeah. In a in a fundamental way, but aren't they at the same time extremely deterministic in the sense that with the exception maybe of Minecraft you yeah. always have to progress and you can never make l make do by just staying in the early game and just by foraging for example. Yes or they are, they completely yeah. are. And uh, that's the, I mean I don't think that game developers try to say that, they do that unbeknownst to them because a, a, a very good part of these games is having fun. So if you take the progress out of it, then you just do almost nothing because what you end up doing is creating an organic primitive society. I know you don't like the word primitive, but there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Here it is anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any final questions? <laughs> throw it. Throw, I'm, no, I'm, I'm really. Uh, maybe I should have. Really, okay, I'll try it from over here. Be athletic, duck, duck. <laughs> uh, sort of, sort of. More her, more her uh, benefit than mine. <coughs> um, so I'm very intrigued with the idea of like a landscape being, like a virtual landscape being a ecosystem. Uh -huh. And then I'm, I'm thinking back to the first set of talks about what exactly do people choose as, to fictionalize yeah. and what do they keep as real. So as a biologist, I look at those yeah. types of games and I wonder, um, could you study you know, the gameplay or how something evolves yeah. over time? And um, you, know, you can't really do that in Minecraft because it's always iterating off of itself. But um, at least you have the modes in Minecraft and you'll find the mode eventually you are looking for because it has thousands of modes. That's the good thing about Minecraft. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess I'm, I'm thinking as far as only the landscape oh, okay. being able to evolve over yeah. time, separate from the player. I don't know if anyone of us ever really looked at something like that, but um, I think yeah. I wonder where do people um, decide what remains fiction mm -hmm. and what actually is scientific? That's very hard to answer because there's a, there's a huge uh, array of video games like that. So some of them are more uh, accurate, let's say, in terms like that, and some others are, are not at all. Uh, for example, the main problem is how resources, uh, resources keep spawning again and again and again. So there's, it's unlimited. That's a problem in this, uh, those games. However, again, if you take this, perhaps, if you take this element out of the game, the game then might not become very fun for the player to play. So it's very difficult to take this out also. The problem is that we as 
in the humanities and also you in biology and stuff like that, we have things in our mind of how a game should be and we have created the perfect game in our minds. However, when we try to mediate it to developers, to actually people doing the work, we can't, <laughs> which is the same. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, really, do, I, I really could not really answer your answer consistently, I, I think. No, I just find it fascinating. Because um, my previous work, we mm -hmm. created models of ecosystems mm -hmm. that were real life and more like simulations. But oh. no one really wants to play a simulation. Exactly. And then you, it does make me wonder as far as research, where do you draw the line of what qualifies something that is a simulation that's very realistic into something that is yeah. actually entertaining and playable and, and drives an audience to continue to interact with it. So I found this very fascinating. I'm not at all qualified to answer that only as a, as a gamer and I wouldn't mind playing something for some time at least, playing something tedious that uh, <laughs> keeps, <laughs> keeps, keeps repeating itself and uh, then believe I, that I am immersed and this is actually an ecosystem and that's great because it evolves, it goes on and, and so on and so forth. But it seems that for the grand majority of uh, the population, this is not very uh, likable, to be honest. 